Okay, so I'm just going to pray. The younger ones can stay in as well. I have no problem. It's just I think I'll still be there. So let's just pray. Yeah, Father, I thank you, Lord. It's good to give thanks. It's just great to hear um, Jean and Jan pray there, Lord. Um, yeah, we give thanks, Lord. We give thanks for the unseen. We give thanks for the, the anonymous. We give thanks for all the things that you're doing behind the scenes all the time and we don't see. And um, Lord, we, we, are, we do get to see that picture eventually, but a lot of the time we don't um, when we're in it. And uh, Lord, it's so good when we look back and we just see your hand on everything, on all of our lives. And um, just pray right now, Lord, as you share uh, a bit of a testimony of my life, Lord, that, um, Lord, would you speak to the hearts of the people here, um, encourage them, stir them up, Lord, hopefully um, inspire them a bit as well, because um, hopefully it will explain a story of someone uh, who didn't amount to much, that God can make somebody. So, Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to go for this. <coughs> Teddy's killing somebody out there or something. <laughs> right, okay, so I was born at a very early age. Uh, it's one of my favorite chairs. <laughs> Okay, uh, sorry. I was born in Enfield, which is north of London. Um, my mum met my dad was working in Hamleys in London. Has anyone ever heard of Hamleys? Yeah, yeah. The Hamleys is a huge toy store. It's still open to this day. Um, yeah, so uh, they met there. Uh, they were married in 1979. Uh, not long after that, I was born, so something wasn't quite right with the maths there, was it? Um, we moved to various places in and around London. Um, in 1982, I had a sister called Gemma. Um, a bit later after that, we moved to Surrey, um, which is probably the last time I can really remember my family being in a, in a family unit. Um, and kind of the last kind of times I remember really sort of a childhood as a, like being a child with a family. Um, in 1985, we moved to Bristol, um, actually in Mangersfield, in which, um, St. James's Place. We moved onto that road. Um, and not long afterwards, my, uh, my mum and dad got divorced. So, not long after being in Bristol, they got divorced. Um, unknown to me at the time, it was to do with my dad. Um, however, as a kid, as a, as a guess, as a boy, I saw that very differently. So, I saw. Um, it was very much painted a picture to me that it was my mum's fault. So um, I just blamed my mum for the whole of my childhood um, for it. Um, my mum got remarried um, soon afterwards, um, which didn't really help with my conclusion of what was going on. And um, um, my stepdad, he was uh, an abusive man, um, both physically, mentally, um, to myself, my sister and my mum. Um, I, I, I think this is really important because I was told recently, someone had a chat with me and said, oh, I heard that you were brought up in a really nice privileged background with your grandma in Malvern. And I wish I had. I really do. I really wish I had that upbringing. Um, even though I was able to visit my grandma now and then, my life was not as privileged as I would have liked to, to have been or as um, centered around having a childhood. It was very much one um, centered around being um, in a place uh, which I didn't really want to be in at all. Um, my stepdad, he was a bully, uh, mentally and physically abusive and manipulative. Um, I, from a very young age, um, distanced myself from my stepdad immediately. I didn't have, I wasn't interested in a relationship with him whatsoever. Um, and but because I did that, I also put a barrier between me and my mum as well. So I didn't really have a relationship with my mum uh, as a kid. Um, especially like it used to be when I was obviously younger, um, which is quite a tough thing for a boy because I think boys, who's a mum, who's got a boy, Jess, yeah, that boy mum relationship is a big deal I think, isn't it? And so I never really had that. I've got a better relationship with my mum today, but it's, you know, you want that as a kid I think. But I made those choices as a six year old, funnily enough, that's quite weird, isn't it, to make those choices um, in that way. So. 
Um, so there we go. Some of the things that I went through as a kid, um, I remember being hung out at the uh, top, um, top floor window um, by my ankles by my stepdad. That was not fun. Um, I was beaten with a bamboo cane. Um, I used to get bruised um, in that way that it would mean that when I went to have, I couldn't have a shower at school because people would see. Um, I couldn't really live a normal life as a child. It just was so impossible to live like that. I remember having friends around my house and basically, um, it's not getting any darker by the way. It's just in case you get worried, it's a safeguarding officer. So sorry, that's as far as it goes. Um, but basically, um, uh, yeah, I remember having friends around my house and he would come home early for whatever reason and we had to like shepherd them out the back door because if he caught us then you know there would be all sorts of problems which is really embarrassing as well isn't it as a kid we sort of say sorry you've got to go um, and you've got to go out the back door and you've got to do it really fast um, he, um, he kicked me and my sister out of the house once um, we came home and he said don't come back um, we were I don't know quite young at the time probably like Ben's age um, and my sister's three years younger than me um, and we had to go out into, like we just went out and we played, you know, I did what I used to do, which is play football at the back and then um, uh, I had a really good friend, um, I'll talk a little bit more about later, but um, they lived on the same road as me, so um, we were able to go there when it got dark, because it got really dark, and we didn't know what to do, we told not to go back, you, didn't, you know, so my mum got home from work and she said, where's those kids, because obviously that's kind of the first thing you think, where, 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 where's my children? And he said, oh, I don't know, I don't know where they are. He didn't even say anything about what he'd done. So my mum um, frantically was getting out, like trying to find numbers and all sorts of stuff to try and find out where we were. Um, and eventually she obviously managed to get hold of um, where we were, which is great. Um, but she wasn't happy with me or my sister. She was like, what is wrong with you? Why have you left? Why did you go off? That is ridiculous. And, and I remember she was going out that night and she said, right, you're staying here, you're not coming out with me. And I said, no. And it was the first time I remember, because I think when you're in an abusive kind of relationship, you are squished down. If anyone's ever had that kind of relationship, you do feel like oppressed. And you just have your head down and things like that. I don't know if anyone notices, but I don't make eye contact with people very well. I was trying to Anne the other day about it, and I still wasn't making eye contact with her. That's really weird, isn't it? So I was still, someone trying to learn, and I'm trying to get better at it. But I think sometimes that's because you just got your head down. If you have that kind of upbringing, your head is down a lot, you just feel pushed down. So um, so for me, like that was how I was. I was very quiet, I kept to myself to myself. I didn't really stand up for anything that was going on. Just let it happen, took your licks, I guess. And, um, but this time it was like, I don't know how old I was, 11 or 12. And it was like, and I was just like, no. I, I remember shouting, I was like, no way. I, I see you getting away with this. There's no way. He told us to leave and my mum was like, is that true? And it's like she had another child. You know like when you're dealing with your children and you're trying to work out which one's done what? That was literally what happened. And he was willing to allow us to get not only punished and told off for what he had done, um, but, but also like my mum was obviously manipulated into believing that. And that was pretty much kind of like our relationship and how I was brought up. So it's just to give you a background. I know, I know there's people actually in this very room that have gone through far, far worse. I know that there's people that go through far worse, much more than that. But I think it's really important for you to know my background because sometimes people think, oh, you've got this, this and this. And if that, if there is a story going around about my upbringing, being very nice and privileged, then that might give people a perception of thinking that I've been given everything on a silver platter and it really isn't the case. And I think it's really important for people to know. So we can put that one to bed. Right. Um, Listen to this, so Isaiah 43, 18 to 19, it says, Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do not perceive it. I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Now Mike will be the first person, as he has many times, to tell me I settled around Israel. But do you know that this, well, it's my Bible, it's my book back. The word of God is a living, breathing word. Do you know that? It means you pick it up, you read it, and you look at it, and it will tell you something for you. Because God speaks directly, he has a personal relationship with you, and he'll speak to you. So, we know all the promises that Israel has, we've been studying a lot about that, but this is also personal. It's, a, it's God will say to you, this is about you as well. This is about the reality of, don't worry about what's gone on before, forget what's happened before, because I'm making a way in the wilderness. And many of us have gone or are going through the wilderness in our lives. 
Um, and God is saying, I'm making a way through that. You forget what you've gone through, forget how it's happened, you know, move forward, press on. Okay, my health. My health really sucked. Okay, so from zero, zero age zero, um, I was diagnosed with asthma and I had it ever since my whole life. Um, I remember I was even chatting with my mum more recently and she was sort of saying actually even that first, so I can't even imagine what it's like for a parent, but when you have a child that can't breathe and you take them to the doctors and they just say it's like, they, don't, they just gave like tablets or something, I don't even know what they were, a cough mixture or something like that. Um, it wasn't for four years that actually somebody said, oh he's got asthma. And that obviously makes a massive difference. So um, I was in and out of hospital numerous times with life-threatening situations. And I'm not exaggerating that because it sounds good. I really was. Like I should have died three or four times because of my asthma. Um, and uh, once I remember even being in, in the hospital on Christmas Eve, uh, which, you know, sucks when you're a kid. Um, I also um, burst my appendix or had my appendix burst um, whilst I was on holiday once and it became septic. Um, and the doctor said that if I had been uh, just a little bit later, I would have been dead now. So it's like, the reason I'm saying this to you is not to sort of say, oh, do you know, my, do I hear my war, more, my war wounds or things like that? It's not about that. It says this in Job 14, 5, 7, a man's days are numbered. You know the number of his months. He can not live longer than the time you have set. You know, God is in control. Yeah? And um, I'm probably going to bring this up at the end anyway, but... I just want to say to you, and I've said this to a, a friend of mine as well, one of the guys that was in the football team because he had cancer and um, he still has to go through um, where you have to get checked up every, every now and then. And I said to him, he said, why do I go through this and all this kind of stuff? And I said, why don't you flip that question? Why don't you flip it and say, why am I still here? Because if you've got cancer, for example, like he did, you shouldn't be here. Gene's a good testimony of that. Jill's a good testimony of that. I don't know if there's any other people here. So why are you still here? If God says he numbers your days and he's in control and he hasn't said his time, time is up, then you're in a privileged position of knowing that God's still got a plan and a purpose for you in your life. And so for me, it wasn't until obviously, I didn't know what was going on in my life as a kid, but when you become a Christian, you start looking back, you think, whoa, God, your hand was on my life, even when I didn't even acknowledge you or know you or anything. You had your hand on my life that whole time, no matter what. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you all can testify to that in, in many different ways. So just be encouraged that if you're sat here right now, if anyone that watches the video later on is still sat there watching the video, then there's a plan and a purpose in you. Don't look back and think, oh, I had to go through this and I had to go through that. Look at it the other way around. Or why did I? Why did God let that happen? Look at it. That you are still here, you're still breathing, you're still alive, and you're still capable of administering the gospel or doing whatever it is in your life. And that's worth something. It means God's got a purpose for you. And that is amazing because God can say whenever he wants, that's it. And he hasn't said that yet. I am not great academically, or I was not great academically. Um, I really didn't enjoy school much. I got two C's, six D's, and an E. Okay, so it's pretty, that's like the most average person you could probably get in the world. And, um, and not only did this bring me um, a lot of abuse of how pathetic I was uh, from my stepfather, but it also meant I wasn't able to do the course that I wanted to do. So even though I tried my best, you know, um, you know, there's always someone there, isn't there, to sort of, sort of basically say, like, put the knife in or, or so. So I had that all my life. Um, but it also, I wanted to go and do a different course, I wanted to do like a, an A-level type course. And nowadays, you, you know, you need a certain amount of GCSEs to go and do that, I only had two. So I had to go and do a lower course to be able to do the higher course. Now, little did I know that my academic failure, okay, would lead me to my greatest ever triumph. Okay, um, I enrolled at Brunel College in Muller House, which, when I was writing that essay, I was like, Muller House, I was in Muller House. Like, that's a massive thing now, isn't it? Like, at the time, I didn't even know what it meant. But now, I'm like, whoa, thank you, Lord. I was doing a GMVQ and IT, um, uh, an intermediate course, which basically was the equivalent of doing, like, four GCSEs. It included English in that, so if I passed it, I would get my English grade, which I got a D in before. But I also had to retake my maths on the site, um, which I got an E in before, okay? So, 
In Psalm 37, 23, 26, it says, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fail, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what went on afterwards, but whatever we do in our lives, we sometimes go through the moment, don't we? And in the moment, we fail. It's just life. Sometimes we just fall short. We try our best, we just don't quite make it. Okay? And when we fail, it's a failure. You know, we didn't, we didn't get the grades we needed, or we didn't pass the driving test, or whatever it is, something doesn't quite work out. Now, there's two things. That's just the moment. It's just happened. It's done. Tomorrow's a new day, isn't it? And, and, and I think when we're in the moment, we're just like, that's it. Life's over. That's the end. But it isn't. And, and so for me, at the time, when I got my GCSE results and all that kind of stuff, and I was only, what, 15 years old, 16 years old, you're thinking, that's it. Life's over. But little did I know, within a year, it was completely the opposite. So it was here that I met someone who changed my life forever. His name was Adam Sullivan. When we started the course together, he was a smoker and a drinker, and, and um, often um, we would spend our lunch times together with a pint and a cigarette. Um, we were both 16, so don't ask us how we got our pints. Um, but we did. And, um, I didn't even know how I managed to. You know, I've always looked pretty young, like I am. But, yeah, so I don't know how I managed to do it, but I think I just used to hang around with a taller guy to make it look like I was with them. But we were at college. There's not very many people at college that were over 18. Well, you know, so I didn't really understand how they even got away with it, but we did. I won't tell you where we got it from, just in case you get in trouble. Um, at the turn of the year, 1996, um, he changed. All of a sudden, in one of our many break times, we used to go to, if we went down the, the pub, we were at this place in our college called the Nest Cafe House. That's where I learned about all the different coffees. You know, you used to just have a spoon of coffee and you drink, and that was it. But then it started turning into like Alta Rica and Colombian and stuff like that. And so we went, me and my friend used to go and have a cake and a coffee and, um, and all that. And um, at one of those many times that we were doing that, um, he started inviting me to his church, and I was thinking he wouldn't invite me to church before, but he just started inviting me, and he just and I was not interested at all. I just was like, oh, that's great, but no thanks. You know, church was dull and boring as much as I respected him. I just was not interested in church. Like, why would I want to go to church? Um, and he just kept persisting. He kept persisting. He just kept on saying, "Would you like to come to church? Would you like to come to church?" And he kept giving me a little bit of information as well, like, "Oh, we do this. Or, it's not as bad as you think it is." And, all these kind of things, and, and it was like one day, two months in, it just, it just hit me, like, why, why not, why not, why, why not go? So, um, yeah, I was a bit of a loner um, when I was in college. My friend up the road, who I was talking about before, I'll talk about a bit later, um, we started to see each other a lot less, so I wasn't out playing football. I used to go out and play football all the time. Football was a big part of my life. It's actually my one place to go and get away from everything, really. Um, but I just got my head down and I just worked hard, I think, just to get through this college course. I really was determined. One of the Saturdays, I remember saying to my mum, I've been invited to church, and I think I might go. And she just sort of like looked grunted at me, I think. So, okay. So I rang my friend, which is a big deal for me. I hate ringing people. So if I didn't ring you, it's because I didn't like to. I will be trying to learn that and get a bit better at that as well. But but basically, um, I, um, I I rang him. I rang him up and I said, "Yeah, I'll come along." And um, his friend, uh, his friend, his dad came and picked me up from um, Kingswood. I met him in Kingswood, and they took me to my first church service. Okay, so before I explain what happened to me. Let me tell you about the extent of the belief that I had in God, okay? So back then, I was a very passionate Man United fan. I'm still passionate, but not as passionate. Um, the extent of my prayers, and just so people don't call me a glory hunter, I'm thinking about you, okay? I supported, I supported, I supported Man United from about 1988 or something like that, and they were rubbish. They were finishing all, all sorts of rubbish positions and stuff, and I don't know why they would pick that team. Liverpool was the team I should have picked at the time, not now, obviously, I'm really pleased I didn't. But, um, but the extent of my prayers and my acknowledgement of God was very focused around my United, okay? So basically, um, about them winning, okay? So I was very passionate, I was like, come on, you know, Lord, or God, I don't know if it's a Lord, but it's probably God. 
And um, now, I'm going to tell you a little secret that nobody knows in the whole wide world. And I think we should keep it to ourselves, but you can spread it if you want. So many people that know football believe that Alex Ferguson is the reason that Manchester United has success for such a long time, where they, where they won trophy after trophy after trophy. I am telling you right now, I had nothing to do with it. It was my prayers, my consistent prayers. I've never cried out so much to a God I didn't even know, or believe, or know what I was doing. So I'm telling you, it was me. Okay, so just in case anyone really says, you say, oh no, I know the real reason, you know, you can, you can let them know. Um, You know, I always acknowledged there was a God, but I didn't know what God. You know, you're that God, aren't you? Like, it's that kind of thing. Um, I remember things like, um, I remember reading bits, stories about Jesus. I remember there's this uh, thing called the Ballad of the Red Man and things like that. That's sort of got a story linked into it. I remember those things in my head. So there was some kind of like, Jesus wasn't that far. You know, I didn't like dismiss who he was. My mum is very scientific, uh, believes in a lot, like the Big Bang and all that kind of mumbo jumbo, um, but basically um, I never sort of grabbed hold of all that and believed in all that. It was just, I think I was very faithy from a very early age. I think I was just, maybe because of my upbringing, because of what, what I was going for, I didn't know, but it was very much like, I think there's more than this. So about one year before I went to church, I don't know if it's a pro like where the approximation is, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was exactly to the day with God, but I, I can't tell you if that was. But I remember, and many people know this story, I remember watching a, a film, somebody died in a film, it's the most random film you've ever seen, and suddenly it was like, and I guess this is like the Holy Spirit, isn't it? It's how the Holy Spirit works, we get that, just that sudden change. Shh. <laughs> um, there's a sudden change in our, um, so it just hits you, like it overwhelms you, and it was like, so I'm really overwhelmed me and it would just hit me and I was a 15 year old kid and it just made me realise that this whole world and my parents and you know anyone that was around me had taught me to believe that we were just here by complete accident and that we're here to live and die and I watched this funeral of this in this film like I said it's the most random film ever and I was just like I don't want to die I don't want to die this, there must be more to life than this and it was like literally like a vocal prayer that I didn't even acknowledge or think about until maybe four or five maybe more than that years into my into my walk of God there must be more to life than this and it was just this prayer that went out to God it was just like I didn't know who God or God or anything but is there more is there anything more than this so just to give you a bit of a an idea of where I was at there was something going on in me I just didn't know what it was, but I did believe that there was something. Um, so one year later, I entered church for the first time. Everyone was really friendly. There were people my age, um, and they weren't dressed like page boys. And, um, and it was different to what I thought. It was in a school pool for starters, which is odd, isn't it? You think, well, that's not what I see on telly. They sang songs, and they were, like, happy as well, it was weird, um, and I joined in with singing the songs, and I really enjoyed it, and then the pastor got up and he preached about spiritual warfare, I really didn't have a clue what he was on about, obviously, it's the first time I went to church, but you know when you, know when you don't really know what someone's saying, but you just make sense, you're like, that just makes sense, and I don't really know what you just said, it was like that, and then at the end of it, he just said, uh, obviously, he must have known I was there because it was sort of like this kind of number. So it would have been like he would have known I was a new person coming. So he would have flipped it, like Ian does a lot of the time, and just make sure that the gospel message is put in there. So he gave a gospel message, and um, and he said, "Anyone wants to receive this God, please step forward." I was stood at the front actually, so um, I just did a step. I thought that's what he did. You know, you're in church. You know, when anyone goes to church for the first time, you're like, "They're going to make me pray. They're going to make me do this." They go. Uh, you didn't really know all the procedures, do you? So, so when you hear someone say, take a step forward, I just did what I was told. I had my eyes shut, obviously. So I just took a step forward, and that was it. And then other people came up for different prayer for various reasons. I opened my eyes, and I realized I was kind of like two foot ahead of my chair, but also two foot 
away from where everyone else was stood. So I just stood like on my own, so I shuffled along with everyone else into line. And right there and then, on my very first visit to a church, my friend's dad, who was Roy Sullivan, prayed a prayer with me to accept Christ into my life. Nigel, who's now the pastor at the sanctuary, he gave me the information that he gave, like the God John's Gospel. And I've never really looked back since. I've had ups, I've had downs, I've had hard times, difficult times. I feel like I've gone backwards sometimes, but I've never looked back and said like that, oh, I never want to do that again, well, that's a mistake. I knew that March the 3rd, 1996, was the day my life changed. In Psalm 119, 146, it says, I cried out to you, and you saved me, and that I may keep your testimonies. In Psalm 121, it says, In my trouble, I cried to the Lord, and he answered me. You know, there are people out there, like me, as a 15-year-old kid, who doesn't go to church, doesn't have any upbringing from church, nothing, but they're saying there must be more than this. And they're crying out to God, and God is hearing them, and he's waiting for the Adam Sullivans of this world to say, would you like to come along with me to my church? Can I tell you about my God? Whatever it might be, whatever you feel comfortable with, do it. You know, um, Jess is here. You want to know why I was relentless in when you were having a struggle, when you were, you know, why I was like, come along to church, come along to church, come along to church. It's because someone did it for me, and I knew it worked. And it just was relentless. Come on, keep coming, don't give me excuses. You know, it was just, it was kind of like that. Until Jess came along, and I knew that, I knew that as soon as Jess came into this place, it would change her life because I knew spiritually there was some God had already done the work, she just needed that reawakening. But we can sit there and say, I tried once, they said no. Adam never gave up on me. He never once said, well, I asked Rich, my friend, he said no, so I'm not going to bother. He just kept on asking me, and he kept on asking me, and he kept on asking me. We didn't stop being friends, we didn't stop going out for a coffee with him. It didn't bother me. But eventually, just at the right time, at the right moment, it just brought me to that place. There are people out there that are crying out to the Lord, and He is waiting to answer them, and He's going to use you, and He's going to use me to just be that little bit of a person that's going to invite them or draw them in. And God will do the rest. The Holy Spirit did all the work. Darren, my pastor at the time, preaching, or the music, or whoever it was, giving a friendly hug, or whatever, didn't have. They, they were all little pieces of the puzzle, but the Holy Spirit turned up and did something in my heart that said, that's what you're missing. That's what you're missing. That's what you need. I helped in youth club afterwards. I went to everything I could. I even went to the sewing group in the first few weeks of going. They were making like a banner, and I said, oh, come. I didn't know what I was doing, but I just wanted to be everything. You can imagine my life, my childhood, and what I was brought up in. I didn't want to be in that house, but God had given me something amazing, and I just wanted to be amongst those people. So I was at the same group making this band. I probably didn't help much, I was probably just doing something else. But I wanted to be at every meeting that I could possibly be at. Um, I was hungry for knowledge. I remember like Nigel was doing a Bible study. Uh, on a home group night and I used to just come along I knew what he was subject he would do I'd be like oh I've been looking up some scriptures for you Nigel and I'd be like showing him all the scriptures of course he probably was very well prepared but he was very gracious in that as well I had no clue what I was talking about I was like oh yes let me talk about worry Nigel and tell you what that means and let, this is what the Bible says I didn't know what it meant I didn't know any of it I was just keen and encouraged and it just stirred up for the first time probably my whole life there was a completion and an acceptance. Like, I was just accepted. Like, Roy and um, Sandra have sold their house and they're moving away. But they were a mass, they were like my parents. When I went to that church, like, I was at their house all the time. They fed me, they prayed with me, they guided me, they instructed me, they gave me so much. And it was like, God knows what you need. He knows what you need. He knows what you're coming out of. He knows what you need. And, and, and it was like God's provided me friends, people my age. I had no friends. Like I had a, a good friend that was on my street. But like I said, we drifted apart because of college. But basically, like, I, um, I was like, I don't know, I guess I was like a loner, a kid that was a loner. God just gave me, not like probably 20 people my age. Straight away, that were friends, people I could hang out with, people we could have fun with, went off and did crazy things together, all in the name of the Lord, or in a clean and nice way. It was amazing. Anthony was part of that. 
Um, my friend, who's Jamie, some people might know Jamie, who I grew up with, he lives on the same street as me, he started coming along with me, I started inviting him to church. I remember, this is the kind of things you do that are crazy, right? So, our, our, back in those days, our video, our um, services were taped, so I, um, I got given some tapes, and I took them home, and I had four, three good friends that hung around me all the time, and I, I hung around them probably most of my childhood, um, when we were playing, doing football and stuff, and basically, um, I took these tapes up to his house, we were just hanging out in his house, and I was like, let me put this worship on for you, because so, you can skip to the end of the preaching and there's worship in there. I was like, putting this worship on in his house and playing it, and my friends were thinking, what is this rubbish that you're playing and what's going on? I was like, oh, this is my church, this is what I do, and two of my friends, they just weren't interested and they walked away, um, and they, 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 um, they, were, they didn't come along to any of it, but Jamie was interested and he started coming along to things, to the youth group and things like that. Uh, he eventually gave his heart to the Lord, and he's now a leader at the, at the sanctuary, and he's got a wife and two children who are involved in that as well. You see what God can do? It's not just about you, it's about those around you. And, um, and I'm like privileged, like, he, he was his um, birthday yesterday, um, he's slightly older than me, which is always great, 17 days older, so I always sort of think he's going to be older. He looks older than me anyway, he just looks old. He's always looked old, actually. But do you know what was really irritating about him? This is a bit of digress. He would always get the ladies. I'd be like, I don't know what he did, he had this charm. He's got it with the older ladies, doesn't he? He's just, he's got this thing, this gift. It's like literally a ministry in itself. It's amazing. Um, I have to send this to him. Uh, but I've known him for almost 30 years. Um, a few months later, uh, my college results came through the post. So my stepfather obviously expected me to fail. He opened them before I got home. So when I got home, they were already opened and stuff. Um, and like put on the side. I passed my course with a distinction, which is the highest you could get. And, um, and that meant I went from a D English to an A star English. And it meant I was like, thank you very much. It's the first time I've actually been happy. Thank you very much, Gary. Okay. I've never really been praised for that. So um, and then I, I got an E in my English, in my in my maths. I retook my maths course. I could only get um, I had to do a certain paper, um, but I got a B, which is the highest I could get. So I went from I changed all my grades around basically, and I became underachiever to accomplishing what I needed to do. And what was great is, funnily enough, my stepdad was very quiet about it, and that was just great because like, do you know what I mean? Like this. If my, when my kids, in fact, when I go to parents' evening with my children and I get a good report back, even if it's not very good, I tell them it's still all right. Um, but we go, we say, oh, let's go down and we'll get, we'll go and get a pudding. We're going to like celebrate that you guys have had, like, that's just parents' evening. It's standard. I expect them to do that. But that's what we should be like as parents. When I get grades like I did, I didn't get that. I just had them dumped on the side like they're a piece of nothing because it didn't give me the expectations of failure. So, so like, just sometimes it's good to acknowledge if you're a parent or if you're just somebody, just praise people. I've said this on Wednesday, lift people up, don't be a discourager, don't come in with all this rubbish of, you didn't do this, it's too loud, it's this. Just tell them they're doing a great job, trust them that they're going to do it okay. Just trust them. And, and, and like, I just, for me, I know that I wasn't trusted to do a good job in the course because I didn't have a very good track record. But what I was able to do was to overcome. And if we can praise people, we can encourage people. And the difference was, is right in the mix of my college course, I found Jesus. And that changed everything. So it, I had God in my corner. I had God praising me. I had God thanking me. I had a family that, was, that would tap me on the shoulder with Christian family and say, that is awesome, that is great. And I did. Be a person that praises other people. Not to build their ego, but just let them know they're doing all right. Even if they're not doing all right, just tell them they are. In 98, I felt God clearly say to me that I was going to become a youth pastor. I remember saying to God, that cannot happen. I'm not gifted, I'm quiet. You do not understand what me being here is as a testimony of who I am. Now, when we did the turn-in a year ago, a load of the sanctuary guys came over, and obviously because I'm part of the leadership here, I'm at the front a lot, and I'm leading things, I'm doing stuff. And they were going like, who are you? What, what, who is, who, where's the little quiet kid? That, if you want to know who I was, 
not that long ago. Go and speak to some people down there, and they'll tell you, I wouldn't say boo to a goose, I didn't want to get up the front, I was nervous, I hated it. Because it was not normal to do that. And so for me, for when I felt God was saying, I want you to be like Nigel, was one of my spiritual heroes, still is, but he, he was, he and is, just so awesome at doing that role. So good at it. And he's probably even better at being a pastor of the church. In fact, he was just good at chatting to everybody. He was a youth worker, and he was great at chatting to everyone. And so when for me, I'm like, that's my marker. I forget about it. Like, there's no way I can meet that standard. There's no way I can be that. And so, to me, I was like, no. But I knew that God was impressing it, and impressing it on my heart. So I did. I sat down with God, because I could be conditional with God. Not really, but he's gracious enough. And I said, God, if you want me to do this, I guess a bit like Gideon. I need this, 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 this. It's a big list. You know, I need confidence. I need to be able to know that I can stand at the front of the church and be able to speak in front of people confidently. I need to pass my driving test. There's all sorts of different things that I felt were necessary to be able to be a youth worker and, and different other, other bits and pieces. I made a big list. I did not like speaking in front of the church. I hated it. I still don't really, but I just can black it a bit better, I think. Um, in 1999, I went on a mission with Adam to the Czech Republic, and it changed my Christian walk forever. If you get the opportunity to go on a mission, do it. Because it's not so much about whether you get to see the culture, or it will just take you out of your comfort zone and do something remarkable with you. That's what I would say more than anything else. The other side is a bonus. You know, the, the culture, the things you learn, um, and all that kind of stuff. But it, the biggest thing is, if you go on an actual mission trip, you will be called to do things that you'll never think you could do. And when you come back, you think, I did? How did I do that? And then you know you could do anything. In Christ. So, we had to preach the gospel. I had to get up the front, in front of a bunch of people in Czech Republic, and preach the gospel. Fortunately, you can, they had to interpret it, so it's a bit different. Um, I had to dance on the street. A lot of you don't know, but I did teach a lot of what Shaolin did last week, two ago. <laughs> Um, I had to do some drama, I had to meet strangers, it was designed to draw me out of myself and it totally worked. I was able to tick a lot of those boxes on that list. Nearly there. In the year 2000 I accepted the role of becoming a youth pastor for the, um, for the first church plant from the sanctuary to go to London. I had a really tough build up going because I think Every distraction going came my way, and God had given me this amazing family. Like, like, can I express to you that I was this four years into my walk with God? God had given me like a unit of people that replaced this family that didn't really care about me so much, and I didn't fit into. And He gave me this amazing family. If you want to know why I'm really passionate about church, it's because I believe in it. And people say to me, "Oh, church, church, church," and I sometimes will do that, but. I believe in it. I really believe in the model of church based on the standard that Jesus has set and the instructions the Word of God says. And if we follow it and we live it, it's the most beautiful thing that you can ever see. And it will impact many people if we do it. And for me, God put me in a family, in a unit that was just perfect. I was like, thank you, Lord. And then it was suddenly there was this opportunity, this draw, to be called to go and give all that up. To give all my friends, all my, my job, even people I made friends with at my, my work that I was in, and to go to a strange place in a way and start something that I didn't really know I could do. I didn't really believe that I could do, but I was willing to go and do it. So, as you can imagine, as you step out in faith with God, every distraction possible is going to come along to try and distract you. And I really went through like a lot of different... Um, situations that were drawing me away and making me think and I knew that it just always come back to the point that no this is what God wants me to do so um, when it came to the last day I got to grips I was surrendering I was willing to give up everything ready to go and then what happens Claire came along on the last day on the, my leaving service I think it's because the Davis has just turned up wherever there was food. I didn't know if it was, it was like a meeting because that was one. Yeah. But Claire and Anne and, and um, um, 
you know, um, Kyrie and Anne came in to the meeting there, and um, and that was the day I was literally getting in the car to drive off. And um, I left for London, settled in. God blessed me with an amazing job. I cannot explain to you how God blessed me with an amazing job. I'm not like talking, well, um, what's it called? It's prosperity gospel stuff. I had a job in Bristol doing administration. I applied for a job to do administration in London, so just administration, and it just happened to be a very specialist job that I managed to somehow get my foot in the door with, that I got given this job because someone left at the same time I was there, and it doubled my salary of what I had in Bristol, and I didn't even live in London, so it wasn't like I needed more money for living. I didn't, earn, I didn't pay more money out. It's exactly the same. And, but yeah, I had this amazing wage. God was awesome, and I was able to um, like be in that career for a while, which was great. And I didn't have to study or anything for it. That's not to say you don't have to study, but I'm just saying God can also make a way. Um, if we step out for God and we let Him have a, like God, we surrender. God will take care of the, the other pieces because we can go out and say, God, I'm not qualified. Like, what does it mean to get a job and earn this much money? God knows what you need, and He will provide. And God has done that in my life then. Um, after, yeah, after, um, yeah, so around about mid 2000, so that's a long time ago, isn't it? 18 years. After she kept ringing and pestering and just turning up on my door, <laughs> sending other people with messages, I decided, okay, <laughs> might as well just see how this goes. It's not really happening. Although well, she did visit mainly, she did come and visit most of the time. Um, then I met Ian and Anne and I thought I want out. I need to get out of this. <laughs> it was too late. <laughs> I've got to tell you this, actually, that's, that's not actually true. But let me just put it into perspective. And I can imagine how Claire would be feeling at this moment. Um, or maybe she was just used to it. But we were all sat in our living room in our house in London. And Anne decides to tell these most embarrassing stories about Ian. I can't tell that I can really can't actually say this. <laughs> I was nearly going to say to you, that would be it, you'd have to leave if I said those stories. And about Rob, I mean really, I'm genuinely saying you cannot know these stories. But, she's telling not only like the people, the guy I was living with, but the church that I gathered that day. And like, people are thinking, oh this is your girlfriends and their family, your family. I, I'm thinking, I didn't know I was signing up to this. But I can't explain, I really can't, and really Anne should never ever utter those words ever again. But, I'm so sorry Ian, I even have that knowledge of you. I don't know how I got there, Anne, but anyway. To Claire knows I love her, because I endured through that. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, we became an item um, in mid-2000. Um, I had an amazing experience in London, I met amazing people, it was there God taught me to be a leader, he really did, I had to step up, no one else was going to do it, and that's how I learned, I had to go lead Bible studies with kids, I had to run youth clubs, I went and hired a hall somewhere in the middle of this crazy estate, and I said right, we're going to run a youth club, and they were nuts, I mean, I prepared for Hillfields because of what I went through in London, and because, I'm telling you, I had kids, hanging off of the building and things like that, crazy stuff. And I was like, God, do you really want me to be here? Claire testified to some of that. But we had amazing times as well. Like I remember like Claire was up with me a lot and we were ministering to these kids. There's just there's an opportunity isn't there with children. We know that. When we got young like youth, they're they're vulnerable. I was a 15 year old kid with that background. There are I'm not the only one in the wide world. There are plenty of them. And they just need to know that there's a, a God that loves them. And, and we were able to do that. We saw some amazing things happen. We saw relationships built. We saw God do remarkable things. Um, I moved back to Bristol a couple of years later. We got married. Um, that was 16 years this year. She doesn't, know. she doesn't even know. I mean, I know the math better. So I, you know when you have that worry when I forget my anniversary? I don't have to worry because I know she doesn't remember. So, I'm all right. So, um, one, of the, one of the last things I had to do on my list was to pass my driving test. So, you know, you know me. I'm very well prepared and organised, way ahead of schedule. 
So two days before I was going to start a youth ministry, I um, set up a youth club, had all the equipment, everything was bought or donated and ready to go. All I needed was a car to donate, so I bought a car. Unfortunately, I hadn't passed my driving test at that point. So I had a car, I had all this equipment, I had to ship probably about two miles to this youth group. We were already declared to come up with, uh, with, uh, with Shanine to come and help run the youth club for the first week. Um, and all I had to do was pass my driving test that week. So I did, it was alright, so I did. That's okay. But, as you get worried about you, but that's how stupid I am. Okay, so don't ever do that. Um, be more organised. But when I think about the list that I had, God gave me, I just realised that that was on the list. And it was like the last tick ready to go. In Matthew 19, 26, Jesus said, look at them and said, with man this is impossible, with God all things are possible. In me, nothing was possible, with God everything is possible. Just trust in the Lord and he will make a way. I, um, I returned to Bristol, myself and Claire got married in 2002, 2006, Benjamin came along. What? Hey Benjamin. Hi. And in 2008, Gracie. That's my family. You see, like God took me from what I didn't have and didn't wasn't privileged to have, and he he built it his way, the right way, through the word of God, through the way we're actually meant to be, and I was able to today have a family, a boy and a girl, my wife, my family, and if you ask me that. When I was a 15 year old kid, 40 year old kid, I wouldn't even think about that. See, God can do anything. God can provide. We just got to honour Him in our lives. In 2004, I was driving my car around Stable Hill area, I think, and I felt God said to me, as He did in 898, and it was like this I want you to go and be the youth pastor in Hillfield. Okay? I said, God, I'm not a youth pastor anymore. And besides, I've never heard of a church in Hillfields. That's pretty much how I said it, and I just drove on. Why does he God speak to me? He didn't go, bridge. He just, in my head. Okay. A few months later, I was chatting to Ian and Anne, and um, they were saying they were going to a new church, and I asked them where they said they, where it was, and he said, we'll go to a church in Hillfields. I said, are you joking? They said, no. I said, okay, maybe I need to come along. And I came along with Claire, at the end of 2004, just a long time ago, and I remember sitting down on one of these brown chairs, and we've been here ever since. And a lot of people at the time were saying that we were here because you know, here. they didn't even invite us to come here. Um, and you know what you know now, the background story that they have. I would never really want to be in the same church with them with those kind of stories. So, <laughs> they tried. But basically, but basically, I. We knew that God had called us, and that's why I talk about family, that's why I talk about church. God loves church, and God's given me a passion, and I hope He's given you a passion, to be church. Not this building, to be church, to be a family. You know, we heard prayers from Jean earlier about, like, what has gone on before, what is happening um, with Joe. It's family, with Brenda, with her friend. We're a unit, we're a family, and it's so important we understand that. You know, um, I'm nearly there. A few months later, I've done that. From 2005 to 2016, which nearly killed me when I looked at 11 years, I did the youth work here. And it actually probably nearly did kill me. Um, in that time, over 30 kids, you young people, gave their hearts to Jesus. We saw. Uh, some of them are not, not here, but a lot, of, a lot of them, some of them are married, some of them are families, some are on mission right now in um, South Africa. We've taken young people on holidays. We've crashed minibuses. Are we supposed to say that? Yeah. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> Twice. Um, we've been on Christian youth camps. We've been on mountains, many mountains. Ian nearly didn't make it down a couple. Um, we have, we've seen young people detox off of drugs before our very eyes. Amazing things God has done. I've seen young people cry out to God. I've seen hatred conquered by love and just hard work reap amazing blessings. We were given the most, we were 
no doubt, the most evangelistic football team in the Church's League. Do you know, people will just feel, how do you do what you do? Well, what we do, guys, is we pray and we just make sure God's somewhere in the middle. They're like, whoa, that sounds too crazy. No, that's all you need to do. And it wasn't happening. Every week we would meet, or every time we met with the managers, um, they were like, anyone got any testimony? Because it's a Christian, it's a church's league. No one had testimony apart from us. Oh yeah, this week someone came into the church. This week someone got saved. This week we baptized three of the football players. It was like, all you've got to do, and me and Joe, when we set the football team up, Joe is a very good footballer. He can play football wherever he wanted, but we made a decision to set up a ministry that would honor God, that God would be at the center of it. And so we did. And because of it, there was amazing blessing from it. Ash, who's our worship leader, came through that. James, who's the other side of Bristol now, came through that. Alex, I don't know where he is right now. People, amazing testimonies of what God did. We saw amazing things happen. We've seen salvations, we've seen healings, the gospel was preached, and we won a few trophies as well. We weren't a bad team. This little hillfields took on the might of teams like Woodlands, big churches, Christ Church, and we beat them. We beat them well. And I love that because not because it's about winning, but because there's something powerful about God taking something tiny, something small, and something that everyone else kind of turns their nose up and turn it into something. And that's what I felt like we were as a football team. Isaiah 6 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. It's that simple. Just say, God, I'm available and He'll use you. You're not going to get it right. Don't be perfect. Did I go to London and do everything perfect? No. But I was willing to go. Did I come to Hillfields and do everything perfect? No. But I came. And I'm still here. You know, and other people that are still uh, called are still here. Did, did I. Um, when I felt that call from God, did I say, no, I'm not going to do it? I said, okay, here I am, sent me, but you know my weaknesses, you know that, what I need sorting out. And God said, yeah, I know, I'll sort that. Two years ago, I was given the privilege of helping to lead this church, and in November, I was given more responsibility to lead this church. I believe that the church is going to see incredible blessings as we continue to move forward with what God has built here. And make no doubt, God is building this place. No man, no people, God, but he's going to use us to do it. I wanted you to know me a little bit because it's really important. People think I'm very confident. I'm not. I'm just really good at blagging it. I just am. If I have to, I can. But I don't want to. Okay, so just if you get the wrong side of that sometimes, that's because that's probably who I am. And what you see sometimes is, oh, Rich is like that. It's, it's something I have to do. It's something I have to draw out of me. And I know God wants to do that in me. But you've got to learn, we've got to learn to change that in who we are. Right? We've got to learn to change, allow God to change some of the things that are a little bit out of off key and not right with Him and get it like that. And we just got to surrender and say, God, okay, I like that bit about me, but you don't, so help me change it. I'm not very good at small talk, I'll try my best, but I love to talk about Jesus, I love to talk about God. If you want to talk to me about God, I will talk to you for a week, non-stop. I guarantee it. If you want to come up and chat to me about anything like that, I will talk to you forever. If you want to talk to me about what you met for dinner yesterday, um, there is another 50 people here that will probably be more interested. I really not interested. I'm not very good at it, I'm very sorry. That's who I am. I will try my best to find out what you met for dinner. I found out yesterday that Lynn made some quiches and uh, I didn't get any. <laughs> Even though we were working out there. <laughs> Anne's a bit upset as well, actually. You're going to have to do all that. We're going to have to forgive. I just want to say Mary's not here, but she bought me cakes. Uh, well, not just me, when we were doing the work. That's an amazing ministry. If you want to take up that ministry in this church, we will support you 100%. <laughs> I grew up with bullies and manipulators, and I see those kinds of people throughout my walk in life, um, and it's particularly when you a ministry. I do not like it, and I know God doesn't like it. So, um, you know, just know that about me. Know that about me. If you're here and you're genuine and you're seeking the Lord, we're going to go on and we're going to sail and we're going to see God do amazing things. We're going to see God do amazing things. Let's do it together. Okay, I'm learning to be a pastor. Of course, it's gone forever. Just imagine if I give you my whole life. 
I'm known to be a pastor, I'm not perfect, but I know I have fruit. I really want to encourage you, the biggest thing that's hit me this week because I've been studying on a Wednesday, is my role, your role, is to encourage one another to bear fruit. Jim was prayed about it right at the beginning. Our role is to bear fruit. And whatever that is, it doesn't mean that you go up and come in and you say, look, look at the 50 people I've been saying this week. What, is, what number did you get? It doesn't mean that. Fruit is your character. It's how your love exhumes itself. It's how you treat other people. It's how uh, your example is to those around you. It is that. But on top of that, it can be preaching the gospel, sharing God's love, inviting people to church. If you want to know if someone's going on with the Lord, check out their fruit. See who's around them. See if they've led people to the kingdom of God. You know, I'm so privileged to, to have Paige in South Africa right now because it's just such a quiet three weeks for me. No, it's not really. I just want to put this in perspective. Put this in perspective. And people that have been in this church for a very, very long time can put this, like, they, they'll get this. This is Hillfields. Hillfields is a, is a place that is very much ignored. Like when I, when, even when God said to me Hillfields, I was like, I don't even know what that is. People don't know where this place is. This place is a, is a place where a lot of people can get dumped because they don't have anywhere else to go. Council people, or, um, have count, the council will dump people that are in need in this area without giving them support. They're just stuck here. There is, uh, well, when I first came, there was a lot of burnt out cars and all sorts of crazy. There's just a real lack of care for this area. People don't really know where it is. It's surrounded by places that everyone knows, and people just drive very through, through very fast through it. In the middle of all that, a little girl, say little, 13, 14 year old girl, started coming along to some of the things that we were doing as a youth group. She separated herself from her group and she was intrigued and she wanted to know more and gradually and gradually and gradually over time she started to seek the Lord and she got there eventually. Today she is in South Africa ministering to children in an orphanage. That is why we do what we do. A child in a messed up life, she can talk to you about that if she wants to, but her life is not great in the past, it's much worse than mine, much worse. She's come through that because we are willing to turn on the light and invite people in and just make an effort. And she's been rescued from the pit. Do you know what it says in the word of God about rescuing people from the pit, the fire? Yeah, she's been rescued from that place, plucked from that place, and she is ministering in another part of the world for the kingdom of God. Think about that. You want to know if I have fruit? It's not all on me, God, God's in it. But I only have to look at Paige and smile and think, okay, God, can we get another one of them now? So why tell the story of me? It's just this. No matter what you've enjoyed in your life, God was and always is with you. No matter what. If, like me, you have had near-death experiences or just situations where you probably wanted to die, know this, that you are alive today because God has not finished with you. Just because you were bullied or abused does not give you, give yourself, doesn't give you the right to give yourself that label. Don't put it on you. Don't be an abuser. Don't be any of those things. Say, that was what someone did to me. I'm going to use it to overcome and be the opposite. You are not defined by your future, by your past, sorry. It does not define your future, that's what I'm going to say. Your past does not define your future. You have an awesome heavenly father and he is enough. I've had about 70 different father figures in my life. I've got one really good one. God can take a skinny little kid with no confidence, no identity, no friends, and make him somebody. Okay? He can turn anything around. He can take anything and turn them into something beautiful. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You want to dance on the streets? You can, because I have. And if I can, you can. 
You want to preach? You can. Because if I can, you can. You want to meet new people? You can. If you want to lead people to the Christ, you can. You want to be used by God? Just say you are available. Here I am. Send me. Don't listen to gossip and idle chat, particularly if it's to bring you down or is talking about others. The enemy is a whisperer and he will whisper into your head all sorts. You know, all my life, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. You're not good enough. And that will always be there in the back of our mind because the enemy knows. But just don't need to listen to it. Don't listen to the bullies who tell you you're not good enough or you're ugly or you won't achieve anything or that you are restricted by your past. No, 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 no. You need to make sure you surround yourself by the right people. Put people around you who are going to love you, encourage you, and stir you up. If there are people in your life that are doing anything opposite of that, just say sorry. If you don't change, I can't have you in my life. Especially if they're following Christ. Because that is not a character of Christ. Rejection kills, but Jesus accepts. If we live in a life of rejection, it can kill us and we can live in that forever. But if we realize that we are accepted by the Most High God, there is nothing greater, nothing better. Never give up on people. Never give up on people. Always keep going. No matter what, keep saying, do you want to come? Do you want to come? Do you want to come along? Do you want to come along? Do you want to come along? Until they're there. Don't stop. Keep going. Because it works. Trust God. He will always deliver if you are always willing to step out. When I look back at my life, God provided everything I needed in the midst of stepping out in faith. God will do it. Even when you fail, there's always tomorrow. Nothing is concrete and anything is possible. It's never too late. I have a relationship with my mum, which is much better than it used to be. Never too late. God can restore, God can repair, and God can still um, complete things that were broken before. And the last one, which I said already, church is so important. Please understand that if I did not have a church to walk into, that I don't know where I would be today, and what kind of person I would be. There was a family and a people that were there to be literally, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't, ask my permission, I didn't have to ask that permission, they didn't give me a document and say, we are thinking about having you in our family, would you like to sign along the dotted line? They loved me and they accepted me regardless of all my quirks and all the things, they just loved me and because of that, I was accepted. Let's just pray. Thanks for listening to Zoom. Father, I just thank you, Lord, that for me personally, Lord, how far you have brought me and uh, I know that there's so much more to do. I know there's so many things I should have done that I haven't done. But God, I just thank you that your hand has always been on my life. And that Lord, right now, right here, that you still have a plan and a purpose because you haven't ended my days. You have not counted the days of the people that are here and said, that's it. They are still here. We're still breathing. We're still going. Lord, use us to preach the gospel. Use us to share your love. Use us to be an example in our lives, our everyday lives. Lord, let us be a family that just will take those 15-year-old kids that will walk through those doors like I did and love them and become parents and brothers and sisters and whatever it is that they need because they could be the next preacher, the next youth worker, the next person on a mission. They could be changing many, many people's lives just because we created, or you created through us, a family that made them feel welcome and part of something. Thank you for church. I'm passionate about church because I believe in your model. I believe in the word of God and what it says. Lord, help us to build it your way. And I thank you, Lord, for everyone that's had such patience this morning listening. Lord, would you bless them? Would you encourage them? Would you stir them this week? Lord, let them know that, Lord, that anything is possible. And, Lord, our past does not define our future. That, Lord, we press on to the goal, not looking back, but looking forward. Lord, have your way in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.
I just want to thank our Father God this morning for allowing Richard to forget all about arranging a ministry this morning. 